What's going on everybody, Mortem here, this time bringing you my review after 100% for Lies of P, a recent Souls-like from developer NeoWiz that sees us taking on the role of Pinocchio, essentially, in a dark and gritty imagining of that fable, which is certainly an interesting premise. Though, before we get into that, I review games after 100% all the time to set me apart from other reviewers on the platform, and while that does include the achievements, it also includes a lot more than that. If you're curious about everything I cover, it's linked in the description below, and my Steam profile is public and linked below as well. On that note though, I'm able to bring you this video slightly ahead of the game's official release, though it is in its early access period right now, due to a review copy that I got sent on September 11th alongside a press mailer to go with it. Though it's worth mentioning the embargo for this title was actually a few days ago when I put up my first impressions video, and we'll circle back to that in a second. In the meantime, Lies of P, as I said, puts us in the role of a puppet awakened by a mysterious voice to hand some problems plaguing the island of Krat. Krat is beset by murderous puppets who went into a frenzy and attacked everyone, which happened on top of a plague that was sweeping the island known as the petrification disease. Our job is to step in and deal with this, or at the very least attempt to, in classic Souls-like combat, though the game does do a few unique and interesting things that I think are noteworthy, alongside a few areas that could definitely use some improvement in my opinion. Now, before we dive into all of that fully, I like to start videos for newer titles with a comment on the technical state of that game, as these days how a game runs, especially at launch, is a pretty important topic of discussion. On one hand, the game ran pretty flawlessly for me. I have a very high-end PC. I'll try to put the specs in the description below if you're curious. If I forget, they're on the channel's about page as well, but I didn't really run into any bugs. The game didn't crash. The only problem I really had is that sometimes the camera was less than helpful, especially if you got pushed into a corner or something, and every once in a while a hitbox would seem, frankly, just a little bit off but that was pretty rare. However, I think something important to note in the technical section of this video is that a couple of days before the launch of the game and after the review embargoes lifted, NeoWiz added Denuvo to the game, which is a third-party software that is meant to keep people from tampering with it. So a few things on that specifically. For me, Denuvo has never really been a big deal. There are some very credible reports that it will affect a various game's performance, and in general, third-party DRM is pretty annoying annoying, but I will admit it is not something that has ever factored into my own decision making when it comes to buying a game. That said, what I don't like about this is that the fact that they slipped it in after the reviews and embargoes lifted and everything, and I'm definitely not a fan of that approach or the decision making there. Especially since I just told you how this game ran for me, and combined with that already being a difficult metric to provide thanks to the large variety of hardware configurations, it's made that much more difficult because now I don't know if a problem was specifically caused by Denuvo after the fact, and it muddies waters that didn't need to be muddy, frankly. But as for how you feel about that, you're going to have to decide for yourself. But for now, let's talk about the rest of the game. Starting with a little note on the difficulty. This is a Souls-like, which is a genre that is known for being challenging, and Lies of P is certainly no exception. I will say this game in particular relies pretty heavily on blocking and parrying, or guard as it calls it, and timing that out perfectly, or close to perfectly, I should say. You'll likely still be able to beat it even if you're not great at it, because I admit I'm honestly no paragon of that particular metric, but your life will be a lot easier if that is a system you can manage to learn and employ effectively. However, most of the non-boss enemies, that's not really an issue. You can mostly just kill them by blocking their attacks in general. And, to make this a little easier for people who are having trouble, just about all of the major bosses, though not literally all of them, have a specter available to help you in the boss fight. That is to say, a summonable minion of sorts that can distract the boss and attack it, which will allow you to focus on dealing damage and less on the blocking outside of just generally getting out of the way. And what's more, a little later into the game, you can get an item called a Wish Stone, which is a customizable consumable that will allow you to either buff yourself or the specter in specific boss fights, which can make up for its somewhat at times woeful AI, honestly. So in terms of difficulty, yes, it's a Souls-like. If you're not a fan of that type of game or that type of challenge, this one isn't going to be what changes your mind, but I do think it was manageable. From there, let's talk a little bit about the story of Lies of P, as it is pretty interesting. As I mentioned earlier, we play as a puppet who wakes up on a train at the behest of a mysterious voice that would essentially like us to deal with the puppet frenzy and the plague on the island. 
Unsurprisingly, this sets us on a grand adventure of sorts where we need to deal with all these problems, which brings us into contact with all sorts of monstrosities caused by both the plague and the puppet frenzy. However, what makes the story particularly interesting is that, much like the story of Pinocchio, it involves lying or telling the truth. There are many situations where you can choose to either lie about something or tell the truth about it, and choosing to do so or not do so can lead you up to three potential endings. Now, honestly, regardless of what you choose during the playthrough, there isn't a whole lot that will change. In a few cases, you'll get a different reward than you would have otherwise, but most of what changes here is the ending, as the game itself is relatively linear. We'll get into that more in the gameplay section, but for the most part, it's straightforward. There's not a lot of exploration outside of where you're supposed to be or doing things out of order, etc. After you beat the story, however, there is a new game plus mode available, which you can do to either see the endings or just continue grinding away and working at the challenge, etc., whatever floats your boat there. And in fact, outside of just the endings and things like that, there is at least one achievement, which is collecting all of the records in the game, which are soundtracks you can play in the hub area, requires you to New Game Plus. You won't be able to do that without doing so. Overall, however, I would say I enjoyed the story. It was surprisingly in-depth. It was much more than I was expecting it to be. It was an interesting narrative. They do a good job of throwing you hints and clues about stuff that's going on via notes, etc., and just actual dialogue with characters that pops up. And if you're paying attention and actually reading everything, I think the story is there and pretty coherent, which for a Souls-like is somewhat of a rarity. Moving on from there, however, let's talk about some progression systems. So we're always going to be playing the same character, however, what will change here is how we build said character. Starting with leveling up and stat increases. As we kill enemies, we will be gaining ergo, which is our experience and currency, as it is with most Souls-likes, and we can spin this to level up. Each level up allows us to enhance one of our six stats. When we first start the game, we can pick from three presets that will give us a good starting point. This is hardly final, and you can customize it from here however you want. But we can increase one of six stats. Three of these are important for basically everybody. Vitality, Vigor, and Capacity, as these are going to affect our health, stamina, and weight, as we don't want to have too much equipped or it will slow us down and thus make us easy to kill, and you also need enough stamina and health to actually get through a fight. The other three stats, however, are our damage stats. Many weapons and things scale off of particular stats and will deal more damage based on what you have in those. So in that regard, you want to raise the damage stat you are actually using the most. However, that gets really interesting when you start taking a look at the weapons of the game, because the other big part of progression is, of course, our equipment. The most interesting of which is easily weapons, as this will, of course, define our playstyle a little bit and the way we attack enemies. There are all sorts of them. There are both normal and special weapons, each of which has their own special attacks, etc. But the interesting thing about weapons is that for the normal weapons in the game, it is actually a weapon and a handle that you are picking up. And a short ways into the game, you'll be able to assemble weapons, that is to say, customize both the handle and the blade of a weapon. Now you can upgrade weapons with various materials you'll find, and this will affect the blade of the weapon. However, in changing the handle, you can actually change the stats and the way a weapon swings by putting a particular handle on it. This allows you to effectively make any weapon scale off of the stat you want, while at the same time making sure that it swings and moves in a way that is ideal to you. Personally, I love love that system. It's probably the coolest thing about this game for me, as that is a really interesting idea in a Souls-like that I enjoyed a great deal. It offers a ton of customization to the weapons beyond what would normally be there. However, the blades themselves determine the special attack of the weapon, which we'll get into a bit later, and overall it's just really cool. Beyond weapons, however, there are other equipment slots we can increase, which will help out with various resistances to certain types of damage, such as blunt, piercing, or slashing damage, or particular elemental damages that would inflict a status effect, that kind of thing. And you can find a bunch of gear, such as your armor lining or your frame, that will affect your resistances to those things. Though that is where your weight limit comes into play. You want to have about 60% of your total weight equipped before you start taking penalties to your movement, which is where the capacity stack 
that comes in. But we're not done yet because another option available to us is our Legion arm. As you can probably see, our left arm is a mechanical arm, and this can be modified and changed out to an arm that has a special ability. We'll find quite a few of these over the course of the game. They can do things like perform ranged attacks for us. One is like a flamethrower. There's one that just acts as a shield that blows up when enemies hit it, which was my favorite. And one of your stats also increases your ability to use Legion arms more effectively. Now, I would say one of the other biggest forms of progression is your organ or your heart. A little ways into the game, we will get the ability to start customizing the mechanical heart that our character has, which allows us to gain extra buffs on top of everything else. This is divided up into phases. Each phase is divided up into several sections of that phase that we can slot a special material called quartz into. For every quartz we get, we can pick one of four different types of buffs to slot into that particular nodule of upgrades. However, you can only use one of each upgrade type per slot. And once you've filled a particular node up, you will get a passive extra benefit on top of the buffs from the individual material slots themselves. This can provide some pretty substantial buffs to your character, especially once you start getting to New Game Plus, because while there is a maximum amount that weapons and things can be upgraded, you can continue to find extra quartz to fill out this organ and thus make you stronger and stronger that way on top of just continuing to level up. And this helps you push past a sort of barrier in progression once you get to a certain point. Some of these are incredibly useful, such as one allows you to quickly use your wish stone in combat, which can make dealing with certain bosses and keeping your specter alive to help you much, much easier. And another one, probably my favorite, allows you to dodge roll after you've been knocked to the ground. So when you're lying prone on the ground, you can immediately roll that into a dodge roll, which isn't something you can do by default. And that one in particular was very, very helpful. So a lot of options with upgrading that. All of the things I just mentioned can be respect once you reach a certain point in the title, but it is like 60% of the way through the game. So if you make a mistake or anything, it is technically possible to undo it or just simply try something else. However, you will have to play a while before you get to that point. From there, let's talk about the gameplay and the world a little bit. Much like any other Souls-like, really, there are checkpoints of sorts in the game called Stargazers. At Stargazers, we can reset all the enemies in an area outside of shortcuts we've unlocked or big enemies we've taken down that don't respawn. And it's also where we can perform tasks like leveling up, switching out our legion arm, etc. However, outside of the stargazers, there is also a hub of sorts where we can talk to a lot of the other NPC characters. This is called Hotel Krat, and it's likely where you'll be doing a lot of your upgrading and talking to characters as well as getting their stories and everything. Outside of combat, this is a pretty big part of, I would say, the rest of the gameplay, as many of these characters can do things that will lead you to extra secrets involved in exploration or finding collectibles, etc. To give an example of this, there are cryptic vessels, as they're called, that can be found. These can be deciphered by someone at the hotel, and then this will lead you on a sort of treasure hunt to find a particular reward. However, many of these characters also have their own little side story that you can sort of uncover if you make certain decisions in certain places, which can tell you a little more about them, which leans
So there are, naturally, quite a few things I want to talk about here. For starters, the block and the parry system. The game calls this guard. Most enemies, you either want to block or perfectly block their attacks. Otherwise, they're going to deal insane amounts of damage to you. Now, on a regular block, you will still take damage, however, you'll pick up what is called guard regain, that is to say that lighter red portion of your health bar after you get hit. If you are to hit an enemy after this happens, you can regain that lost health up to the point at which that light red is still there. Now, if you get hit again, this goes away. This is meant to incentivize you staying on the offensive and trying to pick up that health. However, that can even be mitigated by the perfect guard, or basically a parry. If you time this perfectly when an enemy hits you, Instead of taking the guard regain damage, you'll take no damage and usually be in a better position to counterattack on top of that. Now, where this gets tricky is, of course, enemy timing, where they're hitting you multiple times very, very quickly, or the timing will change mid-combo, things like that. So it's a little harder to do than it is to say, but if you're good at that particular mechanic, most of the combat of this game shouldn't be that big of a deal at all. That said, you can still roll and dodge in this game, like that's definitely an option for you. However, in most situations, what you want to be doing is either blocking or trying to perfectly block something. There are situations where dodge is helpful, but usually it's not what you want to be trying to do. Now, what makes all of this tricky, of course, is the way animations and timers behind the scenes work. For instance, something I really struggled with for most of my first playthrough was the exact timing from the end of an attack I've performed to when I can start guarding. It really took me a while to really get the handle on when exactly I could guard and block, and thus when to stop attacking and start going on the defensive in between combos. Which of course means you can't simply wail on enemies and expect to win in most cases on anything besides a basic small enemy. It doesn't end there, however. Pretty much everything we just mentioned costs stamina, of course. If you run out of it, it'll be easy to break your block or your guard and open you up to attacks, so naturally we don't want that. Though our character can perform light and heavy attacks, and hitting an enemy in in general is going to fill up an invisible stagger meter. When an enemy is staggered, their health bar will start to glow white, at which point if we hit them with a charged heavy attack, it will knock them down and open them up to a fatal attack, which is a big heavy damage combo attack that will deal massive damage. It's also possible to do this to some enemies if you manage to sneak up on them from behind, which makes it great for basically everything. In many cases, you want to try to be staggering enemies or bosses as quickly as you can, so you can get that big heavy attack fatal combo blow in. However, enemies make this a little more complicated by the fury attacks. Sometimes, as you've probably seen on screen up to this point, when an enemy glows red, that is called a fury attack. It's a heavy damage ability that you cannot block normally. You have to perfectly parry it, or you'll take a ton of damage and usually be knocked down as well. However, both attacking and defending against everything enemies do is going to affect the durability of your weapon. This can be dealt with by the grinder that we have, which can repair our durability. However, going to a stargazer or anything automatically resets and repairs our durability for the moment. And what's more, certain status effects, in particular decay, if we get that built up on our character, will actively eat away at your weapon durability. This is mostly a thing in the early game, I found. Once I got about halfway through the title, this kind of stopped being as much of an issue, because there are lots of buffs and things you can get to weapon durability that make this much less of a problem. Because if your weapon durability drops to zero, your weapon breaks, which dramatically reduces your attack, and it is unfixable at that point until you find your way to a stargazer. However, this is also something you can do to enemies. In fact, if you're really great at perfectly blocking things, much of what that does is deal damage to an enemy's weapon, so it is possible to break the weapons of even bosses to make them much easier to deal with, which again is one of the reasons being able to perfectly block well is going to save you a lot of headache here. But if that wasn't enough, we are still not done yet, because then we have the Fable Arts. Each weapon, that is to say the blade of the weapon you have equipped, will typically give you a Fable Art option, which is to say the special attack for that weapon. As we fight enemies, or simply heal ourselves in many cases, we'll be building up this particular meter, and once it reaches the point at which we need it to in order to use our special attack, we can activate it when we're ready, and this can deal all 
sorts of cool stuff. It's really where a lot of the variety comes in, especially in terms of the weapon assembly outside of just making the damage numbers go up. And it makes a lot of weapons feel more unique. And then of course we have the damage types themselves. Each individual weapon we're using will cause a type of damage, both physically and then potentially elementally. Physical damage types like slashing, piercing, or striking, which is blunt, are pretty much what you would expect. However, we also have elemental damage types. Some weapons will deal normal physical damage plus an elemental damage type. My favorite was fire, as a lot of enemies didn't seem to resist this very well, though there were a few. And using weapons that deal both of them will then apply that status effect if you hit them enough. So all the status effects that enemies can put on you, you can also put on them. And all of that combines to make a very robust combat system that can really be played a lot of ways. And if you play it enough, you're likely to find something that you in particular enjoy. And you do have a lot of options for dealing with many of the potentially very challenging encounters, such as, again, the specters to use in boss fights to help distract the boss so you don't have to worry so much about perfectly blocking every time, to give an example there. But I do want to stress here at the end of the combat section, there is potential for frustration here as this game can be very difficult, especially towards the end. And a lot of it is going to come down to how well you manage to learn to perfectly block enemies' attacks at the appropriate time. However, outside of the general intended challenge, I do think the game runs into a few problems in terms of its combat that are definitely worth mentioning. For starters, some enemies, and it's especially noticeable for bosses, tend to just spam the same attack combo over and over again sometimes. And I've seen bosses do like the same attack five, six times in a row, which at least from my perspective makes it seem like they could do some work in how the boss is determining what move to do when. Another much, much bigger issue that I think is genuinely a problem is that sometimes enemies will sort of push your character into a corner and then kind of rush up on you and at that point you cannot move out of that corner and the camera freaks out because you're in a corner and you're basically just dead at this point because you can't see the enemy to block their attacks and you can't move past the enemy to get out of said corner. And the problem with this is that sometimes you can be playing exactly the way you're supposed to, that is to say blocking and everything, but even a parry or a perfect block can sometimes push you back, which can sort of force you into a corner inadvertently, at which point you're suddenly dealing with this issue. And I've died many times to exactly that, and it gets kind of annoying. And then last but not least, before we move on, mostly because I didn't know where else to put this part, is the second phases with full health bars. So the game is divided up into a lot of bosses, as you might imagine, but at the end of every level there is a major boss of sorts. The first couple are pretty manageable, however after the third one, every major boss for a level, outside of like one or two of them that have a slightly different mechanic, have a second phase with a full health bar. And I'm talking this happens like nine or ten times, it gets old. Especially since you have to do both both of these back to back, which means you're essentially doing two boss fights at the end of every single level. And in some cases, these phases have wildly different move sets as well, which can be incredibly frustrating. For starters, because the second I walked into a major boss fight towards the end of the game, you pretty much know it's going to have a second phase, which just gets a little stale after a while. And the full double health bar on top of that really started to wear on my patience towards the end of the game. Now, there are a couple of bosses that don't do this and have more unique mechanics, which which I preferred generally. And while this isn't insurmountable by any means, I just kind of wish they had chose to do a few different things here and there, because when I walk into a boss knowing effectively what the surprise or twist is going to be, that's not really compelling to me. But nonetheless, while that particular thing got a little stale, the combat is good enough that I think it makes up for it, but that's going to come down to personal preference. Now from there, let's talk about the Steam Deck compatibility of this particular game. Officially, the Steam Deck has a rating of playable here, and I think that might be underselling it just a smidge, as the reason it is playable technically is because the text on screen and some of the menus is very small, which is true. However, beyond that, I was somewhat pleasantly surprised here, as the game runs very well on Steam Deck. I don't personally like playing games like this with a controller, which I'm aware is kind of the opposite of what most people enjoy. However, the game ran very well on the Steam Deck. Didn't really have any frame rate issues. The game has full controller support, of course, cloud saves, etc. But remarkably, even on that smaller screen, the game still looks really good and plays very smoothly. If anything, I was surprised I didn't run into more issues here because just judging by the general scenery and things, I was expecting more problems. But there's really no reason you couldn't play this almost entirely on the Steam 
Steam Deck if you wanted to. That, however, brings us to our positives and negatives, and then we will wrap this thing up. So on the positive side of things, we have the combat, of course. I think they did a lot here that makes the game feel fun and unique, especially with all the different ways you can approach it. Probably my favorite part of which was simply the weapon assembly system. I think that adds so much customization to what you're able to do as a player to find something that works for you specifically, and I really liked that system. Though, in general, I think the combat is really great. And I also really enjoyed running around finding all these secrets and dealing with the NPCs that have their own little side mysteries to discover, and combined with the plot about either telling the truth or lying to these people in relation to those mysteries, I got a lot out of that personally. However, the game does have some negatives. For starters, the camera, as I mentioned, there are times where you get pushed into a wall or the camera just doesn't seem to work really well. And in a game that's already challenging when you're dying because you can't see what the enemy's doing because the camera's freaking out on you because you got pushed into a wall or something gets old pretty quick. And it's probably my biggest problem with this game by far. However, other things like enemies just spamming the same move at you, especially when it's a boss, is just underwhelming to say the least, which goes along with a lot of the major bosses having a full second phase with a full health bar that they just do over and over and over again. I do wish there was more variety in what they tried to do with some of those bosses, because like every major boss coming down to big clunky first phase, followed by much lighter and faster second phase with big combos, just got very predictable towards the end. Everything beyond that though is minor nitpicky stuff. For instance, I think the hub area could have been laid out a little better to keep you from running to individual points to deal with a certain vendor or upgrade a certain thing. For instance, upgrading your heart is upstairs in the hotel, but like all the vendors and stuff are downstairs, so every time I want to do this I have to run almost entirely around the hotel stairs when everything else in the hotel is like way away from that. So just like little nitpicky stuff I think could be cleaned up a little bit. But all of that brings me to my conclusion. I had a blast playing Lies of P. It was a very enjoyable experience for me. I played through it several times to see the endings. The story was better than I expected. The combat was great. And while it does have some issues here and there, I don't think they outweigh how well the game does everything else it's trying to do, which made it a pretty enjoyable experience. This particular game is $60 US on on Steam and whatever that is, of course, regionally for people, but this game is also on Game Pass for very cheap as well, which makes it pretty easy to recommend if you like Souls likes. I will tell you that if you don't like this kind of game, this one isn't going to change your mind. It can be a very challenging and frustrating game at points, and some people are just never going to enjoy that. But if you like this kind of game, it's very enjoyable, which makes it easy for me to recommend as a buy, especially if you're on Game Pass, because that's obviously just a great way to enjoy this. With without spending $60 on it. For me, I would say even $60 is well worth it, especially if you're going to play through it multiple times. All of that said, that's going to do it for me. I certainly hope you enjoyed this video. By all means, let me know what you think of this title down in the comment section below, which of course means to like, comment, subscribe, all that YouTube jazz. But regardless of any of that, truly, just thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. May you wander in wisdom and have an amazing day.